<laughs> we'll just quickly introduce ourselves and we'll get into it. So we're a WordPress and WooCommerce development shop and we tend to work with uh, entertainment and news clients and clients that have uh, slightly larger traffic. So our talk today is basically hopefully going to give you guys, even if you aren't getting 10 million page views a month, like our average client, um, that you'll have some idea of what the challenges are when you get mentioned on Oprah or Howard Stern and how you are going to scale up. And also the security things that we uh, apply to those high traffic clients uh, pretty much are things you might want to know about yourself because there's more than just you know, downloading a couple plugins generally to secure an entire web environment. So even though our talk is, tends to be for you know, dedicated servers and scalability to a, a high amount, um, we'll try to hopefully let people uh, learn a little bit that'll apply to whatever level of traffic and whatever your individual security needs are. Um, so uh, you can read the slide. A little about us, we're a local development shop. Um, actually, it's a little higher now, but we serve our clients since 09 serve a little over, so now about 600 million page views a month. So um, the example we're gonna, today we're just gonna do a case study of one client who got a lot of traffic and their site died. They called us and we got them back up. So that's, it's literally a case study of one, but that one case study touches a lot of points. Um, so a little about me, I started the company with this guy. Um, all that's important is I have really cute dogs and I love coffee. And um, I get to work with a lot of really cool companies and nonprofits local. Um, and uh, I've done some fun stuff in my career. So uh, this is Chris, who will be basically covering the actual solution of what we did for this one customer. Uh, we can't name that customer. You can probably reverse engineer it or because um, we're being recorded, especially for legal reasons, we will not name this customer. Um, but. Uh, I met Chris when we started this company, and he's built you know, little things like million SKU databases and an entire platform. So one of our company's projects is an open source project you guys can download yourself. It's a platform to allow you to sell tickets on your website called Open Tickets. And um, so we have 100 customers we built websites for, but we have about uh, 700 people using this platform, which are like theaters. And, and this is a great project, and this is the lead architect and main developer of that platform. Um, mainly uh, expertise in scaling WordPress and WooCommerce. So let's just define these real quick. Scalability is handling more traffic, hopefully without spending more money. So the idea is to scale as, as much as possible with your current resources. That's our first goal, not just throw servers at it. Um, because anyone, you can throw as many servers as you want at something and increase your bill as much as you want, but that's no one's goal. Does anyone here want to spend more money to host their sites? Right. I didn't see, not one hand. So. <laughs> Um, and, and how you do this at a, a high level is basically in the entire stack from the world to the, your WordPress website, how it gets there, you remove bottlenecks. And we'll get into some great detail about how to do that. And why? Because you might be getting, we had a customer that was getting 10,000 page views a month, got on Howard Stern. That changed suddenly. <laughs> so being, planning for not your current traffic, but planning for where you're going to go in the best case scenario is what we try to do, right? It's not, so how do you know that? You have to actually test for that. You have to test for um, using lo uh, like Siege and other tools to slam your site to emulate if you get on Oprah Book Club or Howard Stern, what will, we, what will WooCommerce do when you get on Oprah? Um, on your host, right? So these tools, can scale when configured properly very, very well. Um, in security, you just want to prevent shenanigans. And I am always asked this, well, who's going to hack me? Someone is trying to hack your site right now by the time I finish the sentence. Right now. And uh, on our servers, we host what, 50 some, we host 50 some companies' website. Our average site, because we actually have software we'll talk to you about to prevent all this stuff, gets 300 hack attempts a day, the average one. So divide that by hours, that's, someone's trying to hack our customers right now. And if they, uh, our customers that we manage have never been hacked. If you follow our instructions, the ones we don't manage, if you don't update your stuff, we'll talk about that, you can have a bad time. 
You can have a bad day and you will probably call someone in this room to solve your problem. So who here is a WordPress developer? Awesome. And who here hosts your own clients or manage clients for other people? So that's about half the room. That's great. So hopefully this stuff will be useful for you guys. And we want to learn from you too, so talk to us afterwards. We don't, this is how we solved this problem and how we've learned over time, but this is, just a disclaimer, this is not the only way to solve what we're going to talk about today. This is how we've done it. So that's important to know. Um, so today's case, and then we're going to hand the lapel mic over to Chris after we set it up. So um, again, I can't say the name because of a uh, legal contract, but there was an entertainment website for a big event in another country, and this was the quote, we think we're going to get 100,000 page views on the first day. Uh, and this, the owner of this company happened to know us from another project. Um, so they prepared for 100,000 page views. What happened was, the PR firm had embargoed this for the following day. A friend of the PR firm, who was a blogger, found out about this, uh, blogged it, someone picked it up, tweeted it. Within six hours, it was on CNN, Huffington Post, ABC, NBC. So they got 30 million page views in the first hour. So it's a little more than 100,000. So the word crushed is not appropriate. They could not even boot their servers. Right? They could not even, you can't shell in to boot it. No one could do it even with a KVM. Like you, the only thing you do is unplug it. <laughs> and since it wasn't in their physical facility, they were a little bit hosed. Um, that's a technical term. Um, and that was the exact term the guy used with me when he called, uh, called me on the phone, I called Chris. So we got a call at seven o'clock on a Friday and by 10.30 we'd solved the problem. That's the ex example we're gonna give today to go from completely unable to deliver sites because there was two problems. Massive traffic, right? So you can't do anything. You can't, you can't do anything to your machine. You can't shell in. Um, and because of the publicity, imagine who else tried to get to the website. Exactly. Every hacker in the world, like, oh, that would be fun. So huge zombie net distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, ones that were really smart were doing like rotating IPs. It was really cool. Um, it, well, intellectually, it was not cool for the customer. So if you expect small traffic at 30 million, you're going to have a bad day. Um, so this is exactly the setup and how it failed. Okay, this was two servers with that much RAM. So 16 megs of RAM on a 12 CPU web server, uh, 32 on a 12 CPU database server with SSD hard drives. That's kind of cool, but. Um, that's not going to, uh, with all default configs, so you guys that are more technical understand how bad this was. And the firewall was set to standard um, threading, right? And the bandwidth was non-burstable, so it was, lim it was a set, dedicated, limited bandwidth, okay? So that's, that's the starting point with 30 million page views completely crushing you um, and every hacker in the world. So this is kind of this, uh, uh, in order to recover, at this point, all we could do is stop the traffic completely, right? That's the only way you can get on the server and do anything. So at the ISP, we stopped the traffic completely, and then Chris took over. So you got to take this too. Okay. Bell mic. Yeah. Okay. So this is Chris, and he's got access to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, and how we solve it. So this is the beginning of that. I'll drive slides. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, like Mike said, we had to uh, get in contact with the ISP and uh, work something out. And we wound up uh, setting it up so that we actually had a, a middleman finally that we could actually talk to on the phone, the live time, at, you know, during this entire thing. Basically, what we wound up doing was we blocked every single request from everywhere except from us because we had to get there. <laughs> so um, first thing that we uh, wound up doing was um, we wound up uh, making some big changes to the firewall, um, specifically the, th the main th or the things that Mike's going to be talking about uh, at some point, uh, dealing with specifically what uh, ports we should be having open. Because one of the problems was that you know they didn't have a versatile uh, bandwidth, so uh, they were getting all kinds of uh, traffic coming from all these I, or all these uh, ports 
for, that are not being used, like random port numbers. And uh, it but was taking up, right? It was all <laughs> taking up all the bandwidth because uh, people were trying to hack it. So because it's even though you have all these ports open, you still only have a certain amount of bandwidth if it's not burstable. So we narrowed it down so that we were only uh, serving HTTP, HTTPS, and the SSH connection so that we could actually get to the to the box. Um, and then we started down the trek of well, why did it? Or what, what what can we do to help mitigate this crushing syndrome that's happening uh, by getting all these people uh, coming to the site and not being able to keep up with it. So um, we took a preliminary look at all the configs and we found out that they are all standard configs, which that's problem number one. Uh, you, when you install a piece of software, it's a generic config. It's not, it's not there to cater to your specific needs. So what we wound up doing was we wound up going in and touching each one of the configs and figuring out what things we needed to change in order to allow for a much higher uh, rate of rate of serving. Um, so and luckily so, we had ones to draw from. Right. We <laughs> we do this a lot. Um, as, as Mike said, we have a bunch of clients that get uh, really high traffic, uh, at least compared to most you know most websites. So thankfully, we had some things that we could draw from. Um, specifically, we have uh, a few uh, clients that are big news websites uh, that get all kinds of all kinds of traffic, and they're not you know doing stuff with e-commerce, but just in general, they have a lot of traffic. So one thing, there are really two parts to scaling: is you have the static content which is the stuff that's never going to change unless you made a typo and you need to go in and save a post again or whatever. And then you have the stuff that's always going to change, which is what's in my cart and what is my you know, checkout process and all that kind of stuff. So um, for the static content, that's really, really simple to solve um, with some configuration changes and adding a, one more layer of, of caching. Um, so just moving on. Um, we uh, added varnish. Okay, so for, well, first, who first, knows what varnish is? Okay, cool, awesome. So first, we went in and we we, we did some tuning of Apache. We like we uh, sorry, we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit. First, we went in and did a little tuning of Apache, which is um, making sure that Apache is set to accept a lot more connections. Um, like by default, or it's ready to accept a lot more connections. So by default, Apache opens. Uh, five connections and burst to 20, um, of 20 that are not being used. So basically what that means is that when you start Apache, it starts five processes and those five just sit there and wait for connections. And then as your site starts getting more traffic, it opens up to 20 more available um, to accept new connections uh, that can just be waiting there. Um, but let's just say that you have you know, 100 people coming to your site. That's 100 connect. That's 100 connections, and then it allows 20 more on top of that to to wait for new connections. So when you're having a burst problem where 30 million people are coming to your site at once, 20 is obviously not enough. And even really, without something like varnish, even what we set it to would not be enough. Which is, um, we we upped it to 100 open connections starting and a burstable to an additional 75. So basically that means that when it first starts up, it opens 100 processes waiting for people and then it allows up to 75 additional processes to be open waiting for incoming connections. And that's important because when people are hitting your site, not only is it serving a WordPress page, but it's also serving an individual request for JavaScript, for your CSS, for all your images, every single piece of the page is its own request in most scenarios. So um, the second thing that we did was we talked or we uh, looked at the MySQL config. And there's a few things that you can do with the MySQL config that um, will give you a lot of uh, burstable performance boost. The first thing is to, um, as we all know, WordPress, uh, you know, like a year or two ago, switched to being completely NODB, which is a big, big deal because NODB allows you to set a uh, cache that your, basically your entire database can be loaded directly into memory instead of having to hit the hard drive every single time that a request comes in. So 
on a machine that has 32 gig or 32 gigs of RAM. That's wrong. It's not 32 megs. It's 32 gigs of RAM. <laughs> Ignore that MD. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be like a Commodore. On a machine that has 32 gig, gigs of RAM. that typo before we put it on the site. <laughs> <laughs> almost all databases will fit in 32 gigs of RAM. I mean, there's very, very few out there that are going to be like outside that range. And pretty much none of them are going to be the ones that we're dealing with. So you have this ability to put it into RAM. So do that, and it's going to make it a lot faster to get information and to send it out. The second big, in, or big performance boost for something that, like this with virtual problem is increasing the number of connections that are allowed. So by default, Apache only allows like 100 connections or something like that. I think it's, or not Apache, sorry. MySQL only allows like 100 uh, concurrent connections. But on a server like this, and probably on most of your servers, even if it was one server with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 12 processes, you can still up that substantially. And what we wound up doing was we wound up setting it to like 20,000, which is basically non-capped, because you're never going to have 20,000 connections open, because one, Apache's not going to have that many processes open, keeping connections open. But um, more importantly, if you do get to that point, you're going to have to like scale it out to multiple servers anyway. So, um, all right, so then now that we're past that, what we wound up doing is we wound up adding another piece of software on top of all of this, like sitting in between Apache and the end user, it's called Varnish. Um, Varnish is an amazing tool, okay? Varnish is uh, very, very powerful, and just if, you're, if your site is very static content, like a new site, like I was talking about before, uh, where you're never ever going to have like uh, a change to a page, and if you do, it's really simple, just a lot of cache, then Varnish is extremely easy to set up, like very, very simple. Basically, you throw uh, the software on the server and you make a couple minor config changes and it starts working its magic. Now, what Varnish actually does is it has its own memory uh, bank where it stores cached versions of your content. So, I go to your website. In RAM. Yeah, in RAM. So, I go to your website right now and I generate your homepage. And then, Manny goes to your website, like right after me, instead of re-asking Apache for that same content again and requiring PHP to do its magic and waiting one to two seconds for your page to be generated, Varnish, all it does is it looks in its memory bank and it says, hey, I have a record for this, and it sends it to you instantly. So basically, your PHP page, you know, most of your WordPress websites are going to be like, one to two seconds to generate the page and serve it out. Um, that's not including your JavaScript and stuff like that, just in general. Um, with Varnish, that can be knocked down to like 100 milliseconds. It's very, 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 very scalable. So, so basically your entire site is delivered from RAM. Yeah, your entire <laughs> site is delivered from a, a bank of RAM. Not any resource on the server except RAM. Yeah, I mean there's- It's pretty cool. It does have its own little bit of overhead, but yeah. it's, so small compared to serving it out every single time from scratch. We're so. obviously not going to be able to show configs of all these things today, but just so you know, if you want to talk to us afterward or email, we can share like configs and tips and stuff because like his configs, varnish, like 80% varnish hit rate is really good, and our customers get like 95 plus yeah. hit rate in varnish, which is pretty amazing. So For traffic that sites are getting like 10 million page views a month. So what hit, what hit rate is, which is the thing that you're really striving for in Varnish, is a, a cache hit. Uh, percentage of requests coming in to the percentage of cached versions being sent out. So if you get 100 requests in and you send out 90 from cache, then that's a 90% hit rate. So, okay, sorry. Not as much detail. Okay, so uh, memcache. Okay, this one is very, very important on any WordPress site. Uh, the reason is because um, of the WP options table. Okay, so a big, big bottleneck on almost every website, uh, almost every WordPress website that has substantial amount of traffic is the options table. And that's because of um, the fact that all the configs are in there. And unfortunately, not very many people that make plugins understand this bottleneck. So they want it throwing all of their everything in that table. So what winds up happening is when your site loads up, it the first thing that it has to do is get like three megs of data out of this table. So that is a huge bandwidth 
uh, cost between your web server and your database server, or if it's on the same server, it's a huge resource cost that you have to be penalized for every single time the page loads. So by adding memcache, what you wind up doing is you make that data that's in the WP options table sit inside of um, resident memory from memcache D, um, and it gets served from memory, so it doesn't have to look it up every single time. Right. Um, and the last one is APC, uh, Alternative PHP Cache. So what APC does... My typo, not this. Yeah. <laughs> what, AP, what APC does is it uh, takes your functions in PHP uh, in the background, it takes your functions in PHP, uh, compiles them into machine code, and then stores them in some type of cache in the back end, and then when you need to run that function, instead of recompiling the code, because every single time that you run PHP code, it gets interpreted and compiled into machine code. Instead of doing that every single time, it just pulls it from cache, and it's a lot faster. So basically, it can speed up your PHP just in general. So at this point, basically, there's some uh, things you're going to have to configure. And again, if you want to talk configs, you can talk afterwards with Chris. Yeah. Um, at this point, th oh gosh, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot. We're recording. Okay. Um, so at this point, the server's ready to turn on. And in theory, we're ready to sustain the traffic. However, we still have this issue of security, right? We have um, the uh, pending requests that are all of these hackers still trying to do things. So then we have to lock down the security side as well. And if you think about security, we, and again, it's gigabytes. We take a total stack approach. So you have to start from the outside in is how we think about it. Every step that a user goes through to make an, a request to a web page, what it, devices and software it goes through, have different needs and different needs for security. And I, I won't talk about this in great detail because of time, but basically we start at the firewall level. What you don't need, turn off, period. And never allow root through SSH from remote. Like, just don't do that. Um, this was on here, so who, what's the first thing a hacker is going to try to do is guess root. And if you allow root through 22 from the outside, you're going to have a bad day. Um, so uh, we started the firewall level and we just lock that down completely. A matter of fact, um, the only 22s some of our sites allow us through another server through a, on, through a back way so that we don't even allow 22 on the outside. Um, so 80 and 443 is pretty much all we, all we allow on um, several of our high traffic clients. So you can you port scan all day, you're not going to get through. Um, and then on the server, so then there's a the server itself. Before you even get to WordPress or an application level, there's this great software called Fail to Band. That is basically incredible brute force. And there's a link slide with all this stuff too, so we'll uh, send that to you and we'll have it up on the, the site, I'm sure. Um, fail to ban prevents brute force before it even hits your application level. So our app in this case is WordPress, but there's whatever your application is. And that is amazing software to just basically block anyone before they even try to get to WordPress with logging in. Um, and then if you're running cPanel, there's also this great software called CP Hulk. Um, that's an option for you. Um, and then file permissions. So it's amazing to me how many people have like bad file permissions and allowing like PHP and uploads and all sorts of fun stuff that'll get you hacked in a minute. So changing file permissions and on the website level, which is again WordPress in this case, um, there's a couple plugins that we actually use on a, a level. Now in a multi-site, in, in a multi-web server environment, there are config changes we have to make to these to make them work across multiple servers in a distributed load balancing environment. But iTheme security, WordFence, um, we, we have configs we can share with you because you can make them play really well together. How we use it is iThemes locks down the internals and WordFence locks down the externals. Really simply put, that's kind of how we set it up. And you, with WordFence, you can actually like export a config and import it to a new site instantly. You don't have to set buttons every time. Um, and you kind of can do the same thing with iThemes if you know how. Um, so just some general security notes. So over many sites, um, there's some tips that I just want to share and iterate. WordPress enforces strong passwords, right? Yeah. But not on your shell accounts. Like if you have a shell account that someone can exploit or get and your password is ABC1234 um, and you have wheel, <laughs> 
uh, someone can sudo space dash s and like rm dash rf your whole directory, you're going to have a bad day. So enforce strong passwords on the shell level as well as on the uh, WordPress level. And change passwords regularly, not only on the shell accounts, but on your WordPress accounts. And people ask why. Okay, so unfortunately, a lot of people <laughs> use the same passwords everywhere, right? So this is it's very common. Um, if you don't have your own password generator, there's two things you can do here. One, change your password different for everyone, right? So if Target gets hacked, or what happened recently, if people use LastPass for password management, the password management got hacked, right? So you have to have the ability to quickly change your passwords in a lot of places and use a different password everywhere. But here, uh, why? Because someone, if you get a keylogger on one, uh, not many PCs here, one, P, one PC or Mac in your environment, <laughs> and, um, and that keylogger gets someone in, um, if you change the, it's very unlikely they're going to go in right then and get something. But if you change your passwords quarterly, like if you have 100 authors like some of our customers, we enforce quarterly password changes. They bitch and moan, it's on, it's, but they do it. And that, that site's never been hacked. Yeah. So that's one. Um, trust no one. This kind of sounds obvious, but like in your trust uh, hierarchy, don't trust anyone. Period. And I know that may sound like kind of mean, but that's how we think. Because when you're getting a high traffic website and you're getting literally like a thousand hack attempts a minute, um, you have to think of yourself as like, you have to deliver a website, but you have to do it in a way that no one can get in at any one of these many levels of security. This is really important. Back up everything regularly off site. Um, and depending, this is something a lot of people don't do. Test your recovery process. Actually recover the backup. Tell your customer we're gonna do a test. Uh, delete the site, back it up. Well, don't back it up first. Delete the site and recover it from your recovery process. So untarring your file is really quick, but if it doesn't actually recover your website properly, and there are some commercial ones that don't do things well sometimes, um, and you wanna know that before you have a disaster. Um, this is all we know. Update your WordPress themes and plugins often. And there are people here that do companies that do manage, Word, manage WordPress that will do it for you if you don't know how. And you don't want to do it on your live website. Do it on a staging or a test website first. Make sure your updates don't blow things up. If it does blow things up, you want to do that in a test environment, not a live environment. And keep your code repository in a known good version. This is, yeah, like we use everything in Git. So if a customer gets hacked at five o'clock, we can recover them from our last commit. And for us, there's one additional thing is we do not, we, we do some managed, uh, we do some pretty high traffic sites, but our customers don't have editor, they can't update plugins, they can't update WordPress, they do not have the right access to do so. We do that for them so that they can't blow up their own website. They could change themes, I guess. Like, you, they can press that button. But that's not gonna just, it'll just, we have to click a button back. And so here's a bunch of links, and I know we have covered a lot, but the end result of this was three and a half hours later, that lame server environment was sustaining 30 million page views an hour. The first 48 hours of this event, it averaged 30 million page views an hour in two servers with a firewall. And this is how you do it. It's not, it's not magic, but it's a lot of experience. And these, each one of these has configs, and if you want to learn about them, this is the man to learn from. And for security, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. And I think we have um, five minutes? Five minutes. First question, do, do you combine the cache software or you pick one of those three? Uh, these three all work together. Yeah. So you, choose, you use all three of these. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, sorry. Do, you, do you choose one cache software um, or, and, and Chris's answer, because I have the lapel mic, is the varnish, memcache, and, and um, APC. APC work all together. They do different things, but they work all together in great harmony when set up right. Yeah, you want all three of them. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I should have actually put that. Like, yeah. you, we won't do a website where the back end is not HTTPS. Period. 
like for the WordPress admin. If you've got 100 authors, you don't want them doing plain text entry of their passwords on a website. Um, an example, I guess, uh, so if you guys want to just go on your web, web page, there's a, uh, I couldn't use the example of the site we did, but there's a website we deliver with pretty much the same environment. If you go to the wrap, the W-R-A-P, um, another company is maintaining that now, but we set up their environment, so just go yourself. It takes like, that site's getting over 10 million page views a month, and you can go yourself and see how fast it loads. That one's a pretty big success story, too. <laughs> yeah, that was a, I mean, their it's... page used to take 30 seconds to load. Yeah, we were hired because 30 seconds is too long to deliver entertainment news. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you can go yourself on that one. And then um, last thing is, just as, as a thought process, so what would you guys do in an environment where there's a four by? Like all of a sudden you have different issues. We're not gonna talk about that, but just things to think about. All of a sudden you have two web servers, three web servers, four. Uh, how are you doing security and, and stuff in a distributed load balanced environment for even more traffic? Um, so questions? Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> in general, WordPress in some development communities got a bit of a bad reputation of being a bit of a speed dog. Um, obviously, the, your example is a kind of high level example, but in general, have you got any tips or recommendations on a kind of average side when it comes to things that they this way? Okay, the question was for, the, for everyone else. Um, WordPress, uh, you said, had got a bad reputation for being a, a slow uh, CMS. And it, historically, that, that may be true, but I think with the improvements that have been made recently, it's gotten better. And the other part of the question is, what would you do for maybe not a 30 million pa uh, page view problem, but like for a normal website? I think this is, from our experience, there's a lot of options. For the average person, WP Supercache is a fantastic tool. It is, first of all, it's an automatic thing, so it's going to work pretty well. And um, it, if you do just the things it says recommended and nothing else, it will speed up your site really well. What we haven't had good experience in, this is us again, this is our experience. We're not advocating or, or uh, denying any other tools. We have not had good luck with other things like in one of the security plugins, there's a button you can press. We, we pressed it once, we had a bad time. So <laughs> um, there are other people that have had good experiences with that, but again, we're doing a particular type of thing. Most of our sites are also have WooCommerce, so those simple caching things don't necessarily work well with that. But WCP Supercache for a you know, moderate traffic, if you're getting five, 20,000, 30,000 page views a month, WP Supercache is awesome. Um, for more sophisticated people, you can get more granular with W3 total cache, but I would not do that if you aren't a developer and know what you're doing, right? So it's kind of different tools for different things. Question? Yeah. Uh, you said that you never had a, a site hack, but uh, you see a lot of people that have the sites hacked. Do you have, have you ever had Why? a website that you have to clean up? And Absolutely. So the question was, um, in, in a, again, this is when we've locked it down in the first place, we've never had one hacked. However, we have gotten lots of phone calls at various times of the day and night for uh, literally had a client who was a super nice yoga client. Like, who's going to hack a yoga client? And they, well, they, they call this a panic because they got that, they, someone had copied the, the Sony hack skull and defaced their site and put up the Sony hack skull. So um, clearly that's not good. But five minutes? Okay. Um, so what we did in that case is that we had everything in Git, right? So we had known good code. The code was, they had, they couldn't update plugins on their own, so we knew we had pristine code that was good, right? And we do off-site backups of not just the database, but your uploads. So your media, everything is somewhere else that's not on that machine. So that took an hour. Total, including, they had like 17 gig, the, the time wasn't doing it, it was 17 gig, 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 gig that had to be SCP'd over. <laughs> so, yeah, on their connection, right. So, um, so that's, a, that's an example, like an hour later, and the, the problem was, that was before WordPress, the new WordPress enforced strong passwords everywhere. Like we can't, if you're gonna change your password to like 
um, I won't say what it was, but it was like their name won. If you're gonna do that, you're, you're gonna get hacked. It's just gonna happen. It's, it's a matter of time. Like, Mike one is not a good password. <laughs> Question back there. Yeah. That's, um, that's one we did, and we did for a, what? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, it, the question was from the drummer. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm a drummer locally with bands. If you want to know, I'll let you know. Um, so um, with WordFence, there is a Falcon engine. They call it, I think that's the name right, Falcon. And we've had customers that have low traffic that have a good experience with that. But when you throw other complications like WooCommerce and some plugins, it didn't play well. So it depends on your situation, but we don't like using, well, I don't, remember the analogy, I like, I don't take, if I have a Prius, I'm not gonna go to a BMW dealership. I'm gonna trust a caching plugin who just does caching, right? Um, so I don't know, has anyone else used Falcon and had a good experience? I don't, so yeah, there. So, but we have a lot of evidence of WP Super Cache, W3 Total Cache, and of course, the tools we use for higher traffic so um, if you're gonna try it, do it on a test site. <laughs> and click all your pages and actually go through your test checkout and make sure it still works. Question? Do you guys use like a CDN, like a content delivery network or anything like oh, that? Oh, good question. Um, so that is, uh, the question was do you use a CDN? Yes, a lot of our clients, especially when they're delivering a lot of uh, heavy images, like uh, we have a very popular photographer site who's like, um, for, for years has been on the showcase like right sidebar, um, like one of the four or five websites. He gets so much traffic just from that, it's crazy. So that's CDN. And uh, the RAP, which we used to reference earlier, uses Edgecast. So it's like, um, and it plays really well with this stack. So you can say, this image, we're delivering all our assets here, but the actual image is stored on Edgecast. So the image is localized to wherever you're coming in through, from the HTML, which is a lot smaller, is coming from one um, cache point. Yeah, if you're going to CDN anything, it should be the images. Yeah, definitely images, especially depending if you're having um, stories with a lot of images, it's a great idea. So Mac CDN, Edgecast, um, those are the ones we've used most. Question? Have we had any issues updating sites, um, setting up caching or CDN? No. Um, one thing that's cool about Varnish is the there's like a Varnish uh, ESI. Uh, which one are you talking about? Where, so um, we'll talk after that. But you can actually set Varnish in a site where some things change regularly. Oh, yeah. You can change like a widget on a sidebar. You can change individual widget timers with Varnish, which is really cool. So like if, obviously ads you just do dynamically, but other Stat, other stuff that changes just so often. So you can have the home page every two minutes. You could have a blog page that never changes, but some of the sidebar things do. The main part of the page can be like 18 hours, and the sidebar things can be five minutes. So you can segment it really, really clearly. But we've never had an issue updating because we update through Git. Right? We're updating code. We're not updating. Um, we're not updating layers. You know what I mean? We're just updating code there. And in a multiple environment, you obviously update and distribute. You have other issues, but it's very simple for us. And I think that's the last one. And if you have any other questions, we'll take them in the back and get the next speaker up. And thank you guys so much.